Um, okay, so hi, I think I've met most people, but in case I haven't, I'm Keaton, I'm a postdoc here at the CCA. And uh, since Rich couldn't give his talks this afternoon, I just threw together a quick um, presentation, probably only an hour or so, on uh, spectral methods for solving PDEs, which is what I work on. So um, we've heard a lot about other methods for solving hydro and MHD equations, uh, mostly finite element or finite volume, finite difference methods. Um, but spectral methods are a, a very different type of numerical method with very different properties. And they're not suited to every problem, but they're really good for some types of problems. So I think they're just good for everyone to, to know a little bit about. Um, so one like quick motivation is uh, it's, I think, still the case that the largest turbulence simulations in the world are ran using spectral methods. So these are uh, very large scale incompressible turbulence simulations um, on the order of 8,000 cubed Fourier modes. So these are the sort of the highest Reynolds number domain filling turbulence simulations in, in the world. And um, spectral methods are very expensive methods. So you'd say, why would you choose that method if you're trying to do the world's biggest turbulence simulations? Um, but the, the trade-off is that they're extremely accurate. So you get a lot of bang for your buck using spectral methods. So to, to actually resolve things at these really high Reynolds numbers, it's, uh, the scaling works out such that the accuracy over the cost still improves with large scale. Um, if you're interested in the types of flows that spectral methods can handle. And I'll get into the limitations of those um, later. So just like the four quick sections, uh, first I'm just going to do a general introduction to spectral methods. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, this code called Daedalus, which is a spectral code that I developed during my PhD. Um, then I'll show some applications and examples, some fun movies and stuff. And then if we have time, we can talk about spectral methods for curvilinear domains. So if you want to use spectral methods in spheres or disks or things like that, there are some special things that you have to do. Um, OK, so first of all, uh, yeah, what, what is a spectral method? So spectral method is probably one of the easiest numerical methods to describe and also pretty much the most general. So uh, a lot of the other methods we've heard, um, we heard about specific implementations that like preserve specific properties of the equations or the solutions and, and sort of efforts and, and the history of tailoring these different methods to uh, you know, maintain certain conservation laws and things like that. Uh, spectral methods don't do any of that. They're, they're a very simple procedure. You say, um, instead of expanding my uh, unknown variables, which here we're just going to call U, um, over some set of grids or faces or edges or volumes, we just write it as a sum of coefficients times a set of global basis functions. Um, so that's our representation. That's our discretization is that uh, you know, this, this would be an exact representation if we kept an infinite number of terms in this series expansion, but instead we're going to truncate the sum at some fixed n, and that is the sense in which the variables are discretized. And then say we have a partial differential equation, which I'll just write in general as h times u equals f, so h is a, here we'll consider it to be a linear differential operator, f is some function that could be uh, a nonlinear function of, of u, that's just anything else that we put on the right-hand side. And the way that you solve the equations with the spectral method is by projecting the equation. So you insert the expansion into the equation, and then you project the resulting system against another set of basis functions. So in the, in the traditional parlance of the finite element community, and then also in the spectral community, we call these uh, trial functions for the functions phi that we're using to expand the basis, or to expand the unknowns. And uh, the test functions are psi, these ones that we're projecting against. So this is how you discretize the equations. You do this projection for some fixed number of, of uh, test functions, and then you end up with this matrix system here. You know, this looks just like quantum mechanics, because that's how quantum mechanics works. So uh, you just have this discrete matrix system times the vector of unknown coefficients equals the vector of the coefficients that come from projecting the right-hand side against the same vectors. So at this point, this general PDE is just reduced to a matrix problem. And this is how all spectral methods work for pretty much all equations. So, so they're very generalizable and easy to adapt to different PDEs. So we can do systems where we just have multiple variables and multiple equations. Um, and you just follow the same exact procedure, and you just get a larger matrix system that you're solving. Uh, the fundamental limitation of spectral methods is that this only works in simple geometries, right? So uh, we have basis functions that do a good job of representing functions on periodic intervals. Those are Fourier series. Uh, you can use polynomials for closed intervals. I'll get into some of the details of that. You can use spherical harmonics for spheres, things like that. But in general, you're, you're not going to be able to discretize around complex geometries. So this really works well only for 
boxes, cubes, spheres, those types of, of simple domains. Um, the other big advantage, which I alluded to earlier, is that uh, they're very accurate methods. So if you use the right set of uh, basis functions, then you'll typically get exponential convergence to smooth solutions. So if your PDE has a smooth solution, as you add more modes, as you increase n, then you're going to uh, converge exponentially towards that solution. So this is really the power, right, as opposed to a second order, third order, fourth order, finite volume method. Um, this is basically like an infinite algebraic order or exponential converging uh, algorithm. One of the other big downsides, depending on what you do, is that uh, these methods give you essentially equivalent resolution at all points in the domain, so they're not really adaptive. So uh, they don't lend themselves very well if you only have small scale structures in a small volume fraction of your domain. Um, neither good nor bad, I would say, is that uh, another limitation of spectral methods, though, or requirement of spectral methods, I would say, is that they require that the PDE solution itself is resolvable. So it turns out that this method has very little and essentially no numerical dissipation at the grid scale. So you can't rely on IELTS simulations, like we heard about before, to, to actually dissipate turbulence, for instance. If you have a turbulent hydrodynamic system, you have to explicitly include uh, viscosity or magnetic diffusivities, things like that, so that the PDE you're solving actually has a smooth solution at the scale at which you're, you're resolving it with these spectral coefficients. So to a lot of people, this is a drawback if they're used to working with these implicit LES schemes and other numerical methods, because they're saying, you, you know, they say, okay, well, I can't do as high Reynolds number flows in the spectral method, for instance, because I can't just have my, uh, have my solution go all the way to the grid scale. I have to like roll it off by adding an explicit dissipation. But I think the, the other side of that is you could argue that, um, I mean, you're sort of controlling what's happening at the grid scale a lot better this way, right? You're forced to actually add physical terms that regularize the solution at the scale that you're resolving it. And so you know exactly what those terms do on the small scale, right? So if you're, if you're dealing with a process where you're not sure, like maybe an MHD turbulence, what is happening at the small scale and how that feeds back up to large scales, then it's hard to be confident maybe that, that your numerical dissipation from your numerical scheme is actually representing the right sort of like subgrid physics. Um, whereas here, you're, you're forced to specify that yourself. Um, okay, so just a few details on the most common spectral uh, series here. So the most common one for sure is the Fourier series. So uh, Fourier series converge exponentially for functions that are smooth on, on periodic domains. So Fourier series are used to simulate periodic boxes, you know, very, very commonly. Um, so they have a few important features, though, besides just this exponential convergence. Uh, one is that you can compute the coefficients from the values on a grid in order n log n time using an FFT. So this is a, a fast transform. So for instance, if you need to set up initial conditions on the grid and then compute the coefficients, or if you need to compute nonlinear products, that's typically done in grid space. You can switch back and forth between the modal representation and the nodal representation of your solution very quickly. The other really nice thing about Fourier series is that the uh, discrete form of the derivative matrix of the derivative operator, so the derivative matrix is diagonal, right? So that makes uh, solving PDs with Fourier series is very simple because typically the PDE is completely separable and you can just solve a separate ODE for each of the uh, Fourier components. And the only coupling is in the right-hand side, not in the linear terms. Um, if you don't have a periodic dimension, though, then the basis of choice is the Chebyshev polynomial family. So these are uh, a series of classical orthogonal polynomials. They're orthogonal on the unit interval under some weight. Um, they can be defined trigonometrically uh, with the change of variables relating z to the cosine series. And the, uh, in, uh, the interpretation is that basically if you, if you draw cosine functions on a cylinder and project them into the plane, then the projections of those cosine functions are the Chebyshev polynomials. So from the simple change of variables, you inherit a lot of the nice features of Fourier series. So if you're trying to solve a problem just in a, in a closed domain, and you use Chebyshev polynomials, you'll get exponential convergence to solutions. You get a fast transform, because you can use the DCT uh, to, to convert between the polynomial coefficients and the values on a grid. Um, but the big drawback, the big difference between polynomial spectral methods and Fourier spectral methods is that the derivative matrices are no longer, uh, no longer diagonal. And in fact, for regular Chebyshev polynomials, they're, they're dense. So that looks like this. If I take the derivative of a Chebyshev polynomial, and I project it against another Chebyshev polynomial, I get 
uh, a dense upper triangular matrix here. So this would make solving PDEs using these uh, very difficult, and, and solving, you know, back solving this matrix is, is slow, or computing a factorization in inverse is also a slow order in cubes. So, um, so for a long time, this sort of limited uh, how far people thought you could push Chebyshev methods. But it turns out that if you actually take advantage of using different trial and test functions, those functions that I introduced at the beginning, uh, you can get much better behaving matrices. So uh, in particular, there's a different type of polynomial that uh, is sparse in the derivatives of these Chebyshev polynomials. So if we sort of project our equations against a different set of functions than we used for the variables, uh, there's actually uh, a procedure you can do and, and basically make any system of equations represented by banded matrices. So these are no longer diagonal, but they're still fast to solve compared to dense matrices. So the procedure, if you have a, a PDE, uh, is kind of like this. So you take a PDE here. This is just a linear wave equation. We can reduce it into a system that's first order in both uh, time and space derivatives. So that gives us this system of three equations. And then that system I can just write in this block form, so this block operator form acting on my set of unknown variables. And the spectral method really just looks at this whole system, and it goes through one by one, replaces these block operators with the banded matrix forms that we get from the previous slide. And at the end of the day, you just have a large uh, coupled system of ODEs where the linear portion is, uh, is represented by a banded matrix. And then you could have, again, general nonlinear terms on the right-hand side. And this is the full spectral method. So at this point, we have ODEs, and we can discretize in time with any method we want. So uh, I haven't said anything about time stepping. That's because the, the whole business of the spatial discretization completely decouples from the time discretization of spectral methods, which is a really nice advantage. So you can use uh, basically arbitrary high order time steppers here. You're not limited uh, to, to uh, a certain type of time stepper just based on your spatial discretization. Um, okay, so the code that uh, I worked on during my PhD for doing for solving general PDs with, with spectral methods is called Daedalus. Uh, we have a website. Um, so this is the this is the development team. So I guess going from left to right here, this is Daniel Akinay, who's a postdoc at Princeton. He's going to be faculty at Northwestern in a year or so. Uh, Jeff Oishi is now faculty at Bates College up in Maine. Uh, Jeff Vassell is a mathematician from University of Sydney. And then Ben Brown here is uh, in astrophysics at, at CU Boulder. Um, so the, the point of the code, I guess, is to uh, yeah just, just provide a nice package for doing that exact procedure I just explained to discretize general PDEs uh, using these sparse spectral discretizations. So, uh, so, right, so the code actually has no built-in equations. You sort of symbolically enter your PDEs, and it parses them into this system of, of sparse matrices. It can handle initial value problems, boundary value problems, and eigenvalue problems all in the same framework. Um, we get high accuracy solutions because we're using global spectral methods again. Um, but it still is a pretty like speed competitive code overall. So uh, the parsing procedure that we use produces nearly optimally sparse matrices for general systems of equations. And then when we're actually integrating those equations, you know, at that point, you're just doing uh, time stepping. Uh, FFTs and sparse matrix solves. So all of those things we can use compiled libraries for. So we use FFTW is a really good FFT library. Uh, Superlu and other numerical linear algebra packages give you fast compiled routines for doing these matrix factorizations and matrix solutions. And then the users specify the applications or the trials? So yeah, so the user specifies the trial functions essentially, right? So if we go back here. So when you describe the, your domain, that basically defines the trial functions. And then what the code does is the code picks the test functions. So the code looks at your equations. As it parses the equations, it determines which test functions to use to give you like an optimally banded system. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah, so it's all, you know, co calls compiled libraries. The code's written in Python, so there's a, an easy to use high level interface. And it's automatically MPI parallelized. Um, so again, the, the big restrictions, right? Simple geometries are restricted to spectral geometries. Yep. Uh, so I think I have a, a slide on that a little bit later. But quickly, so the code detects the separable dimensions of the linear portion of your PDEs. And then 
those matrix solves are are uh, trivially parallelizable because they're separate, right? Um, they're block separable. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the other restriction, right, is that uh, there's sort of no subgrid dissipation, so you have to enter a fully resolvable PDE with a regularized solution. So this example before, um, really what Daedalus is doing is it's, you know, you type in your equations like this, it produces this system, and then the system takes the form of this general matrix system, which is the, the thing that the code actually knows how to solve. So it just says, no matter what PD you give me, it just looks like this, so I'm just gonna use the same procedure to, to solve this. So the actual code, to, so a script to solve the wave equation basically looks just like on the previous slide, so, um, here you create a domain that consists of a 64-mode of a Chebyshev series. You create an initial value problem with these variables, and then you just type in your equations in first-order form uh, along with boundary conditions. And that, that's how you specify the PDE. Um, again, the same, same system handles IVPs, eigenvalue problems, and boundary value problems. Um, so I'll say a little bit about the right-hand side. So I said before, I kind of just said, okay, we put everything nonlinear into the right-hand side. Um, but it turns out that's where most of the computational cost of, of these methods uh, lies, right? So we're time-stepping by repeatedly uh, solving this sparse left-hand side matrix against a right-hand side vector that comes from computing the right-hand side at a given time step. And what goes into that is basically all of the all of the expensive part of the algorithm. So to compute nonlinear terms, which are on the right-hand side, uh, you have to transform your your variables to to the grid, and that involves both doing FFTs, but also parallel communication. Because if I distribute the coefficients over different processors, then to do the FFTs over the distributed directions, I have to send the coefficients back and forth before, so I can do FFTs local to each process. So a given right-hand side call involves MPI all-to-all -all communications. So this is a, a pretty heavy communication step compared to other types of methods, um, as well as these uh, FFTs. Okay, yep, that's all I wanted to say there. So the parallelization, uh, so if you have a multiple, uh, uh, a multi-dimensional problem, then say you, depending on X and Y, is just expanded in the direct product of a series in X and Y. And if, say, the x direction here, these are Fourier modes, um, then the linear portion of these equations, because derivatives don't couple different Fourier modes, is separable, and you basically just get a bunch of one-dimensional problems, say, in, in y, that I can solve independently on different processes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, but I know in some cases it's actually possible that depending on the instruction, uh, like if there is a direct regression, like I have a linear regression, you can calculate how the correlation is actually between the two vectors. Yeah. So I don't know why this would uh, not be good if one can use linear regression to kind of fix those two problems. Yeah, that's right. So if we say, just consider like the, the nonlinearity in Navier Stokes, so just like one component, the other component of it, right? So we end up with something like a quadratic nonlinearity multiplication between two terms, right? So if u is the sum over n of u n phi n, right? Then you're right. I can compute a term that looks like phi. I will go with k uh, u u, right? That's the that's the term that actually ends up in one row of the discrete right hand side, okay? And if we just expand that out, so like we're right, we get that. Okay, is that big enough to read? Okay, so you end up with write a sum over phi ij times coefficient i, coefficient j, and then this is the coupling coefficient you said, right? You can pre-compute this for a general term. 
but still computing this, right? These values are changing every time step, right? So computing this is still an n squared operation, right? Because this is a sum over i, this double sum over i and j, right? This this process, this is this is like an order n squared evaluation, right? Doing this like matrix method. Um, whereas if I take the FFT, that's an n log n, right? That's two n log n's, right? I have to do an n log n for each variable. In this case, it's the same. Multiplication on the grid is order n because it's pointwise on the grid, right? And then n log n coming back. So asymptotically, I'm trading n squared operations for multiple n log n operations. So, so this is called the pseudo-spectral method. This is why we evaluate all the nonlinear terms on, on the grid. Yeah, a fully a fully spectral method is one that would just do that do that uh, n squared computation and never go to grid space. Always just live in coefficient space. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But usually you have at least one you know periodic dim dimension, right? If you're doing spherical harmonics, for instance, right? Then yeah, exactly. The latitude uh, discretization is not periodic, but the azimuthal one still is. Um, okay, so parallelization, yeah, you just get separable problems. Um, okay, so in a, in a for a multi-dimensional problem like Navier-Stokes and Daedalus, you just type in the equations component-wise. So, um, so again, so like Daedalus doesn't implement Navier-Stokes. Most people are using it to do hydro simulations, um, but the way that you enter Navier-Stokes is just like this, right? You you specify variables. Again, it's re reduced to first order in z derivatives for technical reasons, but it's not too important. So uh, this is incompressible navier Stokes, so you can see you just directly impose the in incompressibility condition, the two momentum equations, so we have DTU, uh, linear terms on the left-hand side, remember, so this is the viscous term, so this is minus R times the Laplacian of U, pressure gradient, and then the advective terms on the right-hand side, um, and then the boundary conditions down here. Yeah, that's right. So if I take two Chebyshev derivatives, then I don't end up in that right polynomial basis where I have banded matrices. So instead, we, re we reduce the equations to first order form in the Chebyshev derivatives, right? So I've introduced these extra variables, uz and wz, um, and defined them with these, these uh, constraint equations, right? And now I have a system of equations that's first order in z derivatives. Um, okay. So some just example movies. Uh, so one really nice thing about spectral methods is that uh, since you are basically integrating the, the coefficients, you directly have access to the truncation error of your simulation. So, so here's a plot of the KDV equation. So this is a, a Berger's equation with a regularized with a dispersive term. So here's the initial condition in space. So this is a wave that's going to fold over and create a shock, classic Berger solution. Um, but here I'm plotting on the bottom as the movie goes. We're going to plot the the amplitude of the of the coefficients of the solution as a function of wave number. And so we can see directly that like this initial condition, for instance, it looks pretty sharp here. I might worry that you know I'm not I don't have enough modes to to represent this. But we can see that our uh, solution coefficients are falling to machine precision. Uh, well within the number of resolved modes. Um, so this is just a 1D problem, but but this uh, this point like holds with the multidimensional simulations too, right? Just by looking at the the um, amplitudes in coefficient space and looking at what the amplitudes are of the last retained coefficients in your expansion, you know directly what the truncation error of your simulation is. So you basically know, okay, I'm I'm only integrating this to 10 to the minus six accuracy, or maybe all the way down to machine precision. Um, this is also sort of a fun problem because uh, although it's pretty simple, it sort of illustrates uh, the point about having certain subgrid physics. So if you do that same problem, so this is the Berger's equation uh, integrated with three different types of regularization terms. So just a viscous term here, like a second derivative, a dispersive term, which gives you K to V equation, and then a, a, a Hilbert transform, which gives you an equation called the Benjamin Ono equation. You can see that although the large scale dynamics is the same, you start out with a triangle that forms a shock. Um, the process that's actually causing the regularization of the PD at the small scale uh, 
makes a big difference to the to the global solution, right? So all of these terms are nominally small. Oh, the uh, these regularization terms, right? So small viscosity, small eta, and small alpha in these models. Um, but if you left them off and just wanted your numerical dissipation to to take care of the subgrid effects, you would obviously get the same solution in, in each case because the rest of the physics is, is the same. Um, so yeah, this, this is just sort of emphasizing this point that you know maybe maybe the details of the subgrid physics are important and so it's better to try to have an explicit regularization than just let the numerical scheme take care of that for you. There are soliton solutions to the KDV equation. This initial condition is not like a, yeah. Um, so this isn't this isn't really uh, a specialty of Daedalus, but I just thought I'd mention it. So you can uh, you can also use spectral methods to form what are called spectral element methods. So these are sort of a hybrid of finite element methods and spectral methods, where you use high order polynomial representations within a given cell of a of a cell discretized simulation. So we heard a little bit before about like a linear versus parabolic reconstruction for representing the like internal state of a cell in a finite volume framework. But if you sort of take the limit of saying I'm gonna use higher and higher polynomials to represent what's going on within a cell, you get a spectral element method. So here's just a fun 1D example where we're, uh, we've connected a bunch of 1D segments in a graph and we're solving the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on them and they're all coupled together. So, so each individual segment here has a maybe, I don't know, 30, degree polynomial representation within that segment, and then you can couple them all together through their boundary conditions and, and make this graph. So this is like a model equation, for instance, for um, pulses in, in optical fiber networks. The nonlinear Schrodinger equation is like a amplitude equation for, for optical pulses. Um, this can be done for, for hydro too. We don't do this a lot, but um, it's used particularly in, in aerospace, you'll see discontinuous Galerkin methods and finite element methods, which sort of take this approach to do hydrodynamics. Um, I want to say another word on the, on the formulation of incompressible hydro uh, in, in these spectral methods. So I had the code before for 2D incompressible hydro. Here are the equations just in matrix form. And uh, so one thing to, to maybe point out is the, the way that we're handling the incompressibility condition. So that's the last that's the last row here, right? So along with the momentum equations, we are directly just imposing that div u is equal to zero. So this is also a bit unusual. A lot of other schemes basically use splitting methods to enforce constraints like div u is zero. So they'll do, uh, they'll basically take the divergence of the um, momentum equation and then that'll produce a Poisson equation for the pressure. They will solve that equation to get a pressure and then put that into the momentum equation and maybe do some correction later on. Um, so this method, uh, it, it fundamentally limits the temporal accuracy of your solution though, because any, any splitting method introduces a splitting error that's something like second order in time, for instance. So it limits uh, the, the order of the time integrators that you can use. Um, but since these methods produce sparse matrices, it's actually efficient to just solve the whole coupled system directly. You can impose constraints directly alongside your prognostic variables. And without splitting, the implicit method is, is automatically enforcing those linear constraints, essentially using the pressure as a Lagrange multiplier here. So uh, this lets you basically uh, solve systems like incompressible hydro or other uh, constrained differential algebraic equations with arbitrary order time integrators. So just a quick example of that. So this is uh, those equations. This is Boussinesque hydrodynamics. Uh, so what the movie is, is it's a view from above of a fluid layer that's between hot and cold plates. So this is the classical rayleigh Binard convection setup. And there's this regime sort of at low uh, Rayleigh number where the instability forms these long rolls and then those rolls wrap around and form these uh, spiral patterns. So this is actually something you can see like on your stove at home if you put a little oil in it and you are very precise at how much you heat the stove and these types of things then you can actually see this kind of pattern formation going on. Um, but again, the point is, you know, it's a fully nonlinear simulation, but we can do it with high order time steppers. So this, that case was ran with a third order time stepper and you can show that you get this high order convergence and are not limited to, to the traditional splitting order of incompressible schemes. 
for compressible hydrodynamics, um, a common formulation is to uh, include the hydrostatic background uh, and, and evolve perturbations to that background. So here, this is a formulation of, of compressible hydro uh, in, a, in pressure and specific density, or specific volume, sorry. So alpha is one over the density. And then we actually solve equations for the perturbation variables, P prime and alpha prime. So that introduces, in the linear dynamics, we have the background terms, right? So the, the alpha naught and P naught are describing hydrostatic background of an atmosphere or a, the radial profile of a star, something like that. Um, and we basically, uh, we're not solving linearized equations for the perturbation, right? We're solving the full nonlinear equations, but we've separated the variables into the perturbations and the background structure. And what this gives you is this gives you um, the ability to implicitly time step the sound waves around the background structure, right? Because all the terms involving the background structure and the linear uh, variables are on the left-hand side, and those are integrated implicitly. So this is important because this lets you do fully compressible hydrodynamics, but without a CFL restriction from the sound speed. So that makes these methods really powerful for doing low Mach number flows, like of stellar interiors or planetary interiors. Because in those cases, right, the, the sound speed is very fast compared to the dynamics that we're interested in. So if we had to actually time evolve following the sound speed, we'd have to take extremely short time steps and it'd be very, very expensive. So low, low Mach number flows are actually a very difficult regime for, for many like traditional compressible solvers. Um, but here we can integrate implicitly over that, over that sound speed and just have a time step that's restricted by the CFL of the advective nonlinearities, which are the terms that we're actually dynamically interested in. So here's a simulation of uh, the radiative convective boundary in, in a star. So as a function of height, uh, we have a, a radiative region here, and then that transitions to a convective region in the upper half of the domain. Um, so this is done not in an inelastic approximation or anything like that. We can do the full, fully compressible equations, um, but then time step it on these dynamical time scales. And I guess this is an interesting simulation we're looking at. Uh, how the convective plumes come down and hit the tachycline and then excite internal waves that then travel to the, to the interior. Um, okay, so I think one of my last examples in this section is a, is a simulation of the compressible Kelvin-Helmholtz instability and a comparison with the finite volume code Athena. So, um, so you sort of have this trade-off, right, between, so I said, these spectral methods, they're, they're very accurate, but they're also expensive. Like per mode, they're, they're much more expensive than a finite volume method. So uh, it, it remains to be seen for individual problems, like where does that accuracy perform on, performance trade-off actually leave you, right? Are you better off just doing higher resolution simulations with a low order method, or should you use a high order method? So it, that's a problem dependent question. And uh, so this was a paper that we did just looking at that for the case of, of sort of a moderate Mach number Kelvin-Helmholtz instability to see how the two codes, Athena, which is a finite volume, got an off code, um, and Daedalus compared. Uh, so here's a simulation. So we just have, you know, two fluids of two different densities uh, in an imposed shear moving past each other, and that interface rolls up into these, into these billows. This is sort of a classic, you know, turbulence test problem. Um, and uh, so this was ran at, at a nominal resolution and uh, using, using Athena, and then we ran the same simulation at higher and lower uh, resolutions. And uh, so the, the simulation I showed you in the last movie is, is in the middle here, and then we have a higher and a lower resolution. So the question is to guess which simulation is high resolution and which simulation is low resolution. So who thinks this is the high resolution simulation? who thinks this is the high resolution simulation. Okay, good. <laughs> Lots of people fell for the trap. Okay, so, so the answer is that, yeah, of course, that, that was a trap, so uh, that's not the case. It turns out that the, the, the simulation here is actually the higher resolution simulation with Athena. So that's weird, right? Because you look at these and you say, wait a minute, but this one is like clearly more turbulent, right? So shouldn't that be the, the higher resolution one? And uh, it, it turns out that no, that this, that this instability, this turbulence that's on the interior of this roll um, is triggered by a, a spurious numerical instability. That's not a part of the true solution. So the true solution is that this roll sort of like forms 
and keeps winding up for a long time before it breaks into these small scale vortices. Um, and basically the discretization error of the low resolution finite volume simulation is triggering that secondary spurious instability uh, earlier and earlier in time at lower resolutions, right? So as you add more and more resolution, you're actually doing a better job resolving the true solution, not introducing these numerical errors, and then are staying closer to the true sort of like laminar solution here. So uh, if we put side by side for the same parameters, Athena and Daedalus, you can see that uh, even at 4096 squared in the finite volume method, you still sort of have um, some, some uh, early signal of this spurious instability developing in the core of the vortex, whereas with the spectral method, it's actually not there by 2000, and the 2000 squared to 4000 squared simulations are, are essentially identical. So the spectral method is, is pretty much fully converged by, by 2000 squared resolution. The finite volume one is not converged yet at 4000, so the question is, how far do we have to go with the finite volume uh, simulation to get the same answer? So here's a, here's a plot of, uh, this is the L2 error of the total density solution uh, relative to the highest resolution spectral simulation. Okay, so that's the, relative to the 4,000 squared Daedalus simulation, this is a plot of the divergence, basically, of the, of the lower resolution simulation in time. So it is still a, a chaotic problem, so you don't get the exact same solution, so the, the 2,000 squared Daedalus simulation does diverge um, after a few uh, turnover times, and the rate here is the is the Lyapunov exponent of the flow. So this is the actual rate at which you would expect, you know, close by trajectories to diverge from from a given reference solution. If we plot the Athena errors on top of that, uh, we see that uh, I mean the error is higher, but the most notable thing is that it's actually diverging at a, at a completely different growth rate, right? So this is actually one of the indications that this instability that it's latching onto is, is spurious, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not just starting further away from the true solution and diverging at the Lyapunov exponent, it actually is getting the wrong growth rate. So as we add resolution with Athena, um, the amplitude of that perturbation goes down because we're, we're getting a better initial condition, um, but still it's triggering this spurious instability at 2,000 and at 4,000, as we saw before, and even at 8,000, it still is doing it. So at this point, we almost gave up on this project because we didn't really know what to make of it. Um, but then someone at Berkeley had a, had a computing allocation that was about to expire, and they had a ridiculous amount of time left, so we said, okay, well, we'll just burn all the computer time and run uh, a 16,000 squared Athena simulation. And that one finally did it. So at, at 16,000 squared in Athena, you can see that you lie right back on to the, to the right uh, uh, growth rate for, for divergences from the underlying flow. Ooh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's, I mean, that's like, that's a few million CPU hours. I don't think it's, it's not crazy, but it was more than we wanted to spend on like one line in our test problem. Um, so I guess I'll just mention, so again, like the fact that these line up is sort of coincidence. The point is that uh, it is really the slope here, right? That you, that you know that it's diverging with an unphysical instability because of this different slope. So if we plot the Daedalus 3000 simulation, for instance, that has the same slope, the Lyapunov exponent, but is seated at, at lower amplitude. Um, so yeah, so that's the takeaways. Essentially, right, it takes, for this particular problem, right, and I don't wanna like generalize because this is this particular like moderate Mach number flow, so we, we expect a priori that this is something the spectral method would be good at because it doesn't have shocks, right, it has smooth solutions. Um, but for this flow, right, for this low Mach number flow, uh, you need, right, eight times as much resolution with the finite volume method in each dimension to match the spectral method. So Athena, you know, in terms of its speed per cell, it's about 10 times faster than Daedalus at equivalent resolutions. But if you have to use, you know, eight squared as many zones in Athena to get the same accuracy, now the Daedalus simulation is, you know, six times faster or something than the, than the finite volume simulation there. So the accuracy, so, you know, you hear a lot of times that people will quote, yeah, they'll just quote their, uh, you know, zone, uh, cycles per second or something, right? They'll just give you a performance measurement um, with respect to time to integrate one, one degree of freedom, but comparing different numerical methods, the degrees of freedom mean different things. So that, that's not always necessarily an informative uh, number. Mm-hmm. 
So that's that's a good question. So what you what you can show is that the evolution from this point, like roughly from this point onwards, is physical. So what we can do is we can we can run an Athena simulation, stop it here, right? Take that state, put it in Daedalus, and can continue to integrate it using the spectral method, and then it follows that same line, right? So so it's not that the integration is wrong. It, we think it's really an issue with the accuracy of the initial conditions and like error introduced early in the simulation by, by the discretization. So yeah, so it's possible that if you put on large enough noise, like noise that's matching the level of discretization error of the finite volume method, that that would kick that initial condition into this other attractor, which is going off to that state. Yeah. Um, okay, so I didn't have time to grab the video for this one, but uh, here's a video of a, let's see, Orzog Tang vortex test. So this is an MHD test problem. Let's see, does full screen work here? Um, so this is a doubly periodic uh, MHD vortex. And uh, at, at moderate Mach number again, so the solution, okay, that's a fast video. Uh, so the solution here forms, forms shocks. You can see the shocks running through the domain. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's actually high enough resolution and includes viscous regularization. So even though the solution forms shocks, they're resolvable in the spectral method. So if we uh, take a slice through that domain at some time, you can see the, the sort of shock fronts here and here. But then if you zoom in on one of these shock fronts and actually look at how many uh, grid points basically we have across that shock, you can see that we actually resolve it because we're including enough viscosity to regularize the shock. And so even though it looks sharp by eye, you can, you can resolve it. So, so spectral methods in this sense can do high Mach number flows, um, but this becomes obviously extremely expensive in, in 3D. You know, you can do it in 2D pretty well, but if you wanted to do this in 3D, that those are pretty huge computations. Um, okay, so that was pretty quick. So um, I'll say a few things on curvilinear domains, I guess, but before that, any other questions on, on those examples? Yeah, so you have two options for, for that. You can, you can use like a vector potential formulation, for instance, right? Um, or yeah, you can directly impose div b is zero as a, as a constraint equation alongside the induction equation, right? Just like we do with incompressibility. So, um, so yeah, compared to the other methods we heard about, right? So, so this is gonna give you a solution that is not exactly divergence free. It does not ex exactly satisfy div b of zero, right? Because we're not making an exactly conservative scheme but your solution will satisfy div b zero at the level of the truncation error. So the point of the spectral method is, okay, well, if you, if you just put in viscosities, put in diffusivities, right, then once you resolve the diffusive scale, you'll converge extremely rapidly, right, exponentially quickly to the true solution. So that truncation error should be close to machine precision. So then effectively your integration will be, will maintain div b zero to within machine precision over the course of the simulation. I don't know, I, I think there's also, uh, well, I don't know, maybe this is, this is speculative, but I think there's a few ways to view conservation laws, right? So we know that we're trying to solve a PDE, and we know that the solution should, should satisfy certain conservation laws. So yeah, you might think it makes sense to like make a numerical method that directly imposes those conservation laws. Um, but on the other hand, you can use those conservation laws to assess the general accuracy of your solution, right? So I can have an exactly conservative scheme, but run it in a regime where it's not accurate at all, right? So I shouldn't trust the solution, even though it you know, perfectly conserves angular momentum and, and energy, for instance, right? Whereas if you use a non-conservative scheme, you can use the you know, change of energy over the course of your simulation as a direct diagnostic of like how much overall do I trust this? And you know, if I'm interested in statistics that I'm not uh, computing exactly with my scheme, then uh, I don't have a good way to test those, right? Their accuracy but I might be able to infer it from, from how well I'm satisfying these constraints even though I'm not imposing them exactly. So I don't know, there's kind of two sides to that coin. Definitely for like long time simulations, this can get you into trouble, right? Because even if I have a little bit of div b, you know, if I'm not actually resolving things to machine precision and I have a little bit of growth of div b, then over a very long simulation, that could add up to be a big problem. Um, so it depends on the case. Uh, okay, so 
spectral methods in curvilinear domains. It should be pretty quick. So curvilinear domains are interesting from a spectral method perspective, and this is because the uh, the behavior, the analytic behavior of vectors and tensor components uh, are different than scalars in curvilinear, in curvilinear coordinates. So if I have a coordinate system where I have a coordinate singularity, then uh, the analytic behavior of vectors and tensors is different at that coordinate singularity than scalars. So, so for instance, this is a plot of, uh, of a smooth vector field. So, uh, well, a smooth function of a vector field. So f is a function of x. And here I'm plotting the contour lines of this function f and, uh, and the gradient in the arrows here. So this is a completely smooth, very well-behaved function. But if I look at the components of its gradient in polar coordinates, those coordinates or those components are actually singular at the origin. So if I want to solve a spectral method, or if I want to solve uh, a flow using a spectral method in like a sphere, for instance, to look at uh, stellar convection, stellar interiors, um, or a disk using a, a global disk geometry, then I need to be careful, right? Because I, I don't want to use the same basis functions to represent scalars as to represent vector components, right? If I did that, I would lose the spectral property of exponential convergence because the analytic behavior of the function I'm trying to model, right, either the vector component or a scalar, uh, is very different in those two cases. So you need to be a little more careful. You, you basically need to use basis functions that, uh, that are uh, adapted to these coordinate singularities and then behave differently based on uh, whether or not you're a tensor component or a scalar. So this is true in the disk. This also happens in the sphere. So this happens at the poles in the sphere. And it also happens at the origin in the sphere. So uh, I'll just briefly mention the way, the way that you uh, take care of this in the spheres with a set of basis functions called the spin-weighted spherical harmonics. So the standard spherical harmonics are well-behaved at the poles. So these give us uh, a basis function that's really good for representing scalar values on the sphere. But if I want to represent vectors or tensor components, uh, again, those are singular at the poles. And these uh, spin-weighted spherical harmonics are sort of an extension of the standard spherical harmonics that take that regularity into account. So if I have a general tensor field, T, so this is a general order tensor, sigma here is like a multi-index made up of plus or minus ones, where these indices are a recombination of the standard theta and phi indices. I can represent an arbitrary tensor as a sum over L and M. So again, the standard spherical harmonic quantum numbers and a sum over all of the multi-indices of just numbers here. These are my coefficients, and then these are my spin-weighted spherical harmonics. And these bases have the nice property that uh, if, you, if you take the gradient of one of these uh, tensors, it ends up being just some number. So k here is some number times a different tensor. So this, this equation here looks a lot like the earlier equation, right, where I said the derivative of a Chebyshev polynomial was sparse in this other type of polynomial. Well, you have the same thing here. So you have the for instance, the gradient of a scalar is a vector field, so that is sparse in the basis functions that represent vector fields, not the same basis functions that represent scalar fields. Yeah? Yeah, so, so you can show these are a recombination of vector spherical harmonics so that are closely related. They're doing the same thing. Um, but these give you a really nice way to generalize that to arbitrary order tensors. So this, the sigma can be an arbitrary order multi-index. I can have a fourth rank tensor and do the same decomposition and all these properties hold. Um, so, so, okay, so at the end, this is basically, this looks a lot almost like Fourier series, right? Where if I use the right um, trial and test functions, I can do general tensor calculus in spherical coordinates with banded operators. That's what the, the point here is at the end. Um, of course, writing your PDE in, uh, spin-weighted spherical decompositions is, is not fun for anyone. So what we've been working a lot on is making uh, just a, a vector interface. So you actually don't type any components of your equations. You type in your equation sort of in, in vector-valued form. So that would look something like this. I set up a field, or I set up a domain with a sphere, not important about the details. I say pressure is a scalar field, u is a vector field. Um, and then I can actually write things like div u is equal to zero. Navier-Stokes equation sort of in vector form now, right? Laplacian u, grad p, u dot grad u. Um, and I don't have to basically be aware of any of this decomposition that's all done under the hood by the, by the parser. And you can just enter your vectorial equations. And now this, this problem is also portable to different geometries, right? If I want to solve an equation in a plane parallel geometry with complex physics, I can write it all in. I can write MHD down. 
Um, but then if I want to switch it to a sphere, I don't have to actually change the equation formulation at all. I just change the spectral domain up, up top. Um, okay, so just to finish a few videos of, of uh, simulations and spheres. So this is a simulation of uh, incompressible hydrodynamics with uh, high order Laplacian. So a single Laplacian, a bi-Laplacian, and a tri-Laplacian on the surface of a sphere. So this is a model that came out of biophysics. It's a model for representing um, like active biological matter. So basically, if you have a fluid full of bacteria, these bacteria, even though they're at low Reynolds number, they swim together and form patches that sort of behave turbulently and make these uh, vortices. Um, so this is a, a model equation for that. And the real point is that uh, if you look at the pole of the sphere here, there's nothing funny going on, right? We're not excising any region of the pole. Nothing happens if, nothing bad happens if a flow goes straight over the pole, right? That coordinate singularity uh, really doesn't affect the solution at all. And that's just because everything that's going on there is taken into account in the basis functions. Um, here's a, a similar kind of fun example that illustrates this in the full sphere. So what's being plotted here is a cross section of the full sphere. And inside of the sphere, we've used uh, basically forcing terms to sort of mimic uh, a cube that's convecting uh, from, from the bottom up. So uh, this is like a hot plate on the bottom, cold plate on the top, gravity is just pointing down, not radial, right? We're not in a star. This is just solving convection in a box, but in spherical coordinates. And the point is that most you know, test problems that you come up with for simulating stars don't actually do things like send fast flows through the origin of the star. So instead, this is sort of like an artificial way of, of doing that and actually testing that these basis functions are well behaved, even if you have you know, high velocity plumes going straight through the origin of your spherical coordinate system. And there's no, there's no problems here. There's no time step restrictions associated with a small grid at the origin or anything like that. Um, the basis functions just like do a good job since they analytically capture all of the coordinate uh, behavior. They, they take all that kind of stuff into account. Um, and then just sort of a fun example showing off some of the equation flexibility. So uh, this is a simulation using what's called a, a phase field method to model uh, the, a multi-phase flow. So here it's a transition between uh, a liquid and a solid. So what I'm gonna show you is this is a equatorial cross section of a sphere and the sphere is all, all water and it's frozen outside of this black line and liquid inside of the black line. And we're gonna internally heat the center to drive radial convection. So this is a toy problem, but the physics here is something like a model of uh, the oceans in Enceladus or something like that, where you have an ice layer overlying uh, a convective ocean. And uh, yeah, what, what the interesting things here are, so the, so the convection or the heating is sort of driving this radial convection and that convection is melting the ice as it moves outwards. And, and some of the interesting science applications are looking at things like asymmetries in the ice shell in Enceladus. It's observed to be very like north-south asymmetric. And we're interested in questions like whether or not that's due to feedback with the convection. And so most people, you know, they simulate these systems just in fixed spherical shells. But to actually include this like feedback of the geometry and the melting, you have to use these, these types of methods. And again, it's just a PD. I mean, it has like these scalar fields that represent uh, you know, volume fraction of ice versus water. They have uh, forcing functions in them that uh, basically give you the, the melting terms, the Stefan condition at the melting interface. It's just another system of PDEs, um, but you type it in and it, and it works pretty well. Yeah, so in this case, this is just a toy problem. So here we just, we just did a fixed spatial heating profile. So, so just, yeah, heating is a function of radius. It's just some heating that's confined to the center of the sphere. But you could make that a nonlinear function if you wanted to do um, nuclear burning or something like that. Um, you have to be a little careful because those terms tend to be extremely stiff, right? And if you're integrating them explicitly, uh, you need to be you need to be a little a little careful. But um, <clears throat> yeah, in general, the heating term could be nonlinear if you wanted it to. Um, okay, that's the last example I had to show. So um, that's it. Yeah, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. All right. Soccer time? Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, I guess that's it for today then, right? Because Rich is not not coming back.
So, okay. So see everybody Monday.